the previous two videos were using um, interaction from the outside in, mostly speaking, so where you have a relatively small model and you're working with it with your hands in the workspace in front of you. Uh, and so for that, the navigation tool that is the default where you can pick up space with either hand works really well. So here I'm using a, a much larger model uh, so that you can see how navigation works or what kind of alternative navigation tools you would want to use uh, with something like this. This here is a slider viewer and what we're looking at here is a lidar scan uh, of, a, of a levy or a road on a levy. Um, and this whole thing from all the way over there to all the way over there is about 11 kilometers long. This was scanned by a low-flying helicopter. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to zoom in to approximately, well, to exactly one-to-one -one scale. So currently we are at one-to-one 23. Okay, here we go. And so now at this point, um, navigating in the usual way is kind of weird because the world is now very, very large and picking it up with your hands and moving it around doesn't quite work so well. So one alternative navigation tool now is just to use the handles to fly in the direction that you're pointing. So here I'm going to assign a variator for a navigation tool to the joystick on the right handle. Uh, and then I can just you know, point in a certain direction, fly there, turn around by pressing the button, uh, and so forth. can put myself right down here into this little yard. It's a car right there. Um, and that is one way, uh, one way of doing it. It's not necessarily the best way. So then another alternative that kind of works quite nicely with this uh, is to use a virtual walking navigation tool. So I'm going to bind that as well. Navigation, second walk, and name is kind of the same. Right, left, forward, backwards, don't need this. So now we have this uh, movement circle on the ground. Um, and essentially what happens is that if I now activate this tool, uh, it's going to lock my feet to the bottom. It's going to show me a HUD, which essentially gives a compass, giving the direction in which I'm looking in degrees. So here I'm looking uh, due east right now. And what happens now is if I look to the left, you notice how the environment starts rotating to the right the more I look to the left. So the idea there is I can look 360 degrees around without having to twist my chair all the way around, which would get me tangled in the cable. Um, but whatever I, I'm looking at, just by uh, my, my head will follow the motion will end up more or less in the ideal viewing position. So then with the joystick on the on the razor handle, sorry, on the hydra handle, I can just walk through this thing, I do it continuously keep my feet on the floor. Uh, so I can you know, walk all this vegetation here. If I turn this off real quick, I can fly up to the roof, lock myself back down on the roof, uh, or I can do something, let's see, I'm going to turn myself around and really fly up high. And then, woo, okay, now I'm getting slightly vertigo here. And then I can do a parachute insertion, so to speak, and just drop myself onto the ground. Yeah, I felt that. Um, so this is the walk navigation tool. Uh, and that is another way uh, of getting through, uh, getting through large data fairly quickly. So you have the fly navigation tool on the one joystick, and then the walk navigation tool, which keeps me locked to the ground on the other. Now, right now, what's a little bit strange is that I'm locking my physical floor in my office to the virtual floor of the environment, but because I'm sitting in a chair, it doesn't feel like I'm standing up. Uh, it feels like I'm sitting in a, well, on a motorcycle, on a wheelchair, something like that, um, which is not so great. It's just a matter of configuring it or just actually getting up. Uh, but it's generally better to have the virtual floor or the physical floor is just keeping you oriented. So those are um, uh, two alternative navigation tools uh, that can be used quite conveniently here. Uh, a whole set of other tools is then, if instead of using the razor, for an environment like this one, it sometimes is useful to use a standard old joystick. So here I'm going to grab my joystick. Uh, let me see, where am I? Let's get my keyboard out of the way. Joystick over here. This is just an old uh, Logitech wingman. Okay, mouse out of the way. So. The joystick is set up uh, essentially like a, like a regular joystick. So I have, uh, have a couple of buttons on here to change modes. And the first mode is um, that I am sort of in a virtual plane. So I can you know, move to the left, move up, move down, just by pushing the throttle forward, I can start flying forward. So this is sort of an extremely simplified flight simulator. And of course, still look around but I'm doing that, which is really nice. So you can see I can go all the way there, back to where I was, to the yard here with the plane. Uh, so this is actually, whoa, I'm getting a little bit dizzy here. This is quite intense. 
Um, this is one way of getting around. And then along the very same lines, and that's I, that's, I guess, it's more of a joke than anything else, I also have a, let's see, I'm going to turn this one off. And then I flip over to the helicopter navigation tool, which is an extremely simplified helicopter simulator. So the, the throttle here is not a collective, and I can say start flying up, and then I can just you know, tilt forward and then automatically start flying in the direction. The little diamond on the HUD, that is the flight path indicator, shows me exactly where I'm going. Uh, so right now I'm kind of rising, I want to go underneath those power lines here. And let's see, pick up some speed, go underneath the power lines. I'm not very good at flying this thing, I have to admit. But it's sort of fun to do. Oops, I just crashed into the ground. Well, that is not, as I said, I'm not really very good at it. I um, need to keep an eye on the flight path indicator. Let's see. Keep it level. There we go. Speed up a little bit. Make a nice turn here. Now let's see how the flight path indicator goes from the left to the right. It's just, again, this is more of a joke. I'm not really considering this a serious navigation tool, but it's quite fun to do it, I have to say. And yes, I'm definitely feeling flying around here. Uh, I feel that in my stomach. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool. Okay, let's do a quick stop. Let's see, whoops, here we go, and let's touch down here on the, on the street. Nice slow touchdown. No, oh, not so bad actually. This is, there we go, nice touchdown. And let's go up again. So, this is a, just a whole bunch of different ways to get around. There's one thing that I should mention though, right now we are flying or navigating at a fixed scale of 1 to 1 meaning that this really feels like I'm in the environment, I'm on that street. Uh, if I put myself down here, this really looks like this really looks like two-lane blacktop. Um, so it's quite quite something. If I go over the side of the levee here. Whoa, okay, that was quite something. Whoa. Um, it is very much like, like being in the environment. Uh, but if you do not care about the scale, then there are very effective ways of getting around uh, even without going to such physically based navigation tools. Again, I have a little cable tangle here. Uh, keyboard, this guy goes back over here. Need to idle it out, okay. Okay, mouse is back. Alright, so if you don't care about the scale, then it turns out there's an even quicker way to get around than flying. And the thing is that uh, one interesting way of moving around from the environment is just this combination of scaling and moving. I want to show you something. I'm going to put myself here at the very end of this scan, which is, I think I said, about 11 kilometers long, so it's pretty, pretty big. And then I'm going to really zoom in here. And so now, say, I want to... Let me turn off the 3D video. Uh, now I want to go all the way to the other side, so of course, yes, I could fly there, but that's going to take me, like, a couple of minutes. So it turns out the quickest way of doing this is just to zoom all the way out, and because zooming always works around the point that you touch, I can now just touch the point over there, and then I zoom all the way in again, and you notice how I'm suddenly extremely quickly uh, at the on the other side where there's hey there's a bit of traffic going over the bridge here. It's funny. Um, this here is just some random neighborhood that was scanned. Hey look, there's a pickup truck right there. So this combination of scaling and grabbing to go very quickly from one point to the other to almost warp yourself from one point to the other. That is something that was not intended when we developed these tools. That was just emergent behavior. People realized they had that, uh, that way of doing it. Uh, and that is probably the quickest way that we found, you now back at one to one scale, the quickest way that we found uh, to move through a large environment. But again, you sacrifice the constancy of scale, which some people might consider a problem. Most of our users don't. They actually find that it's a big feature of the software that they can change scale rapidly and arbitrarily. Um, so this is why I pretty much want to point that out, because this navigation tool is not really well accepted, let's just say. Um, but people who do use it for a living really seem to like it. Anyway, I'm just walking around here and falling down from the roof. I'm trying to make myself nauseous, which... nauseated, I mean, which is uh, <laughs> not really happening right now. Oh, look, it's a trampoline in the backyard. Cool. Let me see if I can jump on that. Well, I can't jump, of course, okay. Um, all right, so this was now navigation and interaction with a large environment, and that's sort of the point of the video. Uh, but before I skip out of this, I want to very briefly show you uh, what this software is actually used for. 
uh, it's not just to look at wider data, but it's to, uh, to analyze and quantify wider data. For example, specifically, this levy here, levies have a very um, well-defined engineering specification. So the two banks of the levy need to have special uh, certain uh, inclinations. So the, the one to the river, 20 degrees, that's the Sacramento River over here. The one to the other, say, 30 degrees. And so how can we, how can we measure that? Well, I showed you in the first video how we can do ad hoc measurements by just using a measuring tape. And here we can do data-driven measurement. I can just select a whole bunch of points on the slope of this, uh, of this levy, and then um, I can say, please give me the plane that is best fitting all these points, and so here it goes, uh, and then here we see that this slope is 15 degrees, so it's not exactly up to spec, but close enough, and then if we go to the other side, and I do the same thing there, I'm just going to select a whole bunch of points, not doing a very good job here, but then it doesn't really matter. It's just for demonstration purposes. You can do the same thing. Good. All right, indicate that. And this is very nice and close to 30 degrees where it should be, so that's good. I'm the core of engineers to do a good job here. So that's just a very rough example. We are using the software to do all kinds of measurements from analysis of flood risk to levy safety to checking erosion after forest fires, to measuring exact slip along tectonic fault lines like the San Andreas Fault or the um, El Kappa Fault in Baja California, that was a big earthquake there. So that's what the software is really used for. And it turns out, normally we use it, of course, in a projected VR environment, like in a cave or in a holographic 3 TV. Um, but from what I'm seeing here now, uh, it should work really well uh, in, this, uh, in this system as well. Uh, it's actually surprisingly nice to use, I have to say, given that the rift has fairly low resolution, so when you look out all the way to the distance, things get quite pixelated, but since you're still working mostly with data up close, uh, it doesn't really uh, doesn't really matter as much as one would think. So here we have a nice roof that's exactly aligned. The thin line here points north, so this roof is exactly in the north-south direction, and then this thin blue line points straight up, just in, by way of explanation. Okay, let that be it, and there will be more to come.